Well, well, firstly, what you're all doing here, there's a free bar. Go, drink. It will be much better. Save your time. Eve. So, no, no, nobody's left. Oh, so I have to talk now, which was not part of my original plan. So, welcome to my talk. It's called Whenever I Want to Be a Cyber Terrorist. This is a lovely image of a cyber terrorist, according to the Israeli, Israeli military, which is where I found it, on one of their little bulletin boards where they talk about shooting Palestinians. So, who am I and why should you bother listening? Well, uh, my name's Mike. I flew all the way from the UK to be here. Um, I was up until 3.30 this morning drinking. Thank you. It's never a pretty thing when you wake up and you're blind, and the reason you're blind and it takes you ten minutes to figure this shit out is because you have your t-shirt over your head. <laughs> so, um, another reason why I'm really glad to be here is that at the moment my girlfriend's on her period, so she's gone insane. So being 7,000 miles away, really fucking awesome. <laughs> so, word of warning. Firstly, I will not be dropping out in this. Um, there have been other talks with Ode. This has no Ode. Hence the bar. Leave. Go. Um, I was going to tell you not to videotape it, but people are doing because, you know, people never listen to me anyway. So, I'd like to start with a couple of quotes. According to the UK Centre for the Protection of National Infrastructure that looks after planes and trains and, you know, stops, stops things falling out of the sky, hackers want to get into your computer systems and use them for their own purposes. No shit! <laughs> well worked out, guys! Um, another quote from Estonia. Everyone should be worried, not just Estonia. Um, I think they're talking about cyber war, or they may just be, you know, trying to inflate psychiatric bills or something. And finally, from perhaps the world's finest cin cinematic rendition on cyber terrorism, Die Hard 4. <laughs> Jesus Christ, it's a fire sale! That was me acting, by the way, it's awesome, isn't it? So, what am I going to be talking about? Well, I'm going to be talking about cyber terrorism, which is quite frankly a stupid phrase. I'm going to be talking about a number of claims I've made about it and refuting them. I'm going to be talking about why the media is retarded, because they are. Um, I'm also going to be talking about what an individual can do which can impact upon critical natural infrastructure and offering a few solutions to the shit that is spoken. So, uh, cyber terrorism means many things to many people. Um, concerns about disruptive attacks against uh, comms and IT started in the 80s, and personally I, blame Matthew, I personally blame Matthew Broderick for this shit. Without Matthew Broderick, I wouldn't have a job, it's all that fuckers fault. Um, until 2000, um, concerns grew, and then everybody started freaking out about the Millennium Bug, um, which didn't happen, so well done. Um, but concerns really went insane, like everything else, after 9 11. So, you know. That had nothing to do with cyber-terrorism, but what happens if they'd use computers and not planes? Um, it was first discussed as a term, and this is ironic, as being uh, in an article in, entitled Cyber-Terrorism, Fact or Fiction, we're still having that debate, um, in 2002. So, according to Wikipedia, which is the source of all knowledge in the universe, and completely impartial to, um, technolytics, about which I'll speak later, define cyber terrorism as the premeditated use of disrupting activities or the threat thereof against computers and or networks with the intention to cause harm or further social, ideological, religious, political, or similar objectives, or to intimidate any person in further and solve such objectives. Not only is that a mouthful, it's also fucking wrong. So, uh, there is a degree of history, I should point out, between me and Technolytics and their wonderful, wonderful MD, Kevin Coleman, but I'll talk about that later. Basically, he's an arse, I have proof. <laughs> um, Richard Clark, um, the wonderful, wonderful ex anti terrorism czar of both Bush and Clinton, has been rattling on for years about an electronic Pearl Harbor. Recently, he's come out to say that he didn't actually mean an electronic Pearl Harbor, and he didn't mean cyber terrorism at all. He was talking about something else. Um, in his not all made up book, it's entirely accurate, he claims that China can basically cause widespread disruption and throw the US back to the Stone Ages in about 15 minutes. So, well done to the Chinese. They're really fucking organised. They can destroy an economy, basically reduce this country to a steaming pile of ash and rubble by using computers in 15 minutes. 
awesome. Not only did they make good food, they made good hackers too. Now, the problem is, Clark isn't alone in not being able to define cyber, to cyber terrorism because you guys, as a nation, or your appointed representatives, can't even decide what conventional terrorism is. I quote, the FBI defines it one way, the Department of State defines it another, the military define it yet another way. Now, I personally would say, you know, maybe you could define it as people stomping around the globe in search of cheap oil prices, but, you know, that's just me being an arse. <laughs> Um, it's all based around semantics, though. But if you believe the hype, the very bad people are going to do very bad things, and, and you know, the sky will fall. Oh. Now, most of the claims, obviously, are completely made up. Now, the unfortunate thing about cyber terrorism is it also involves the word cyber, which basically makes anyone using it sound like a complete retard. You know, but not in 1994, the lawnmower man was a shit film, get over it. Now, I'm personally going to define the term as the use of technology to facilitate acts of a terrorist nature. And I know that's nebulous, but it's easier to say than the technologies quote. So, lots of noise out there about information warfare. And this, incidentally, is my favourite Wikipedia article uh, about information warfare, obviously. And it says, I quote, The examples and perspective in this article deal primarily with the United States and do not represent a worldwide view. As so much the internet does. <laughs> so, I would define cyber terrorism, if such a thing can be claimed to exist, as being part of something which I call the pyramid of information security annoyance. Now, Fox News and their veritable village idiot Glenn Beck love cyber terrorism, and I hate disagreeing with Glenn Beck because, you know, one shouldn't kick the disabled. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is my pyramid of IS, IS annoyance and evil. It starts with vandalism, goes up to crime, goes up to espionage, goes up to terrorism, and then war. Now, acts of me computer-mediated terrorism, conventionally seen, or at least to me, as being the last of her actions between all, all that war. War is a fairly retarded way to spend your time. So what I wanted to do was examine the last step before war, and precisely what the evil hacks or and terrorists would get up to. Now, as you may have noticed by the distinct and yet slightly slurred accent, I'm from the UK, which is, you know, the most surveilled nation on the face of the earth. We've got about 400 cameras per man. So, you know, they can watch you go into the toilet. It's really exciting. Um, and the reason why we're surveilled and the reason why we have such shitty legislation is to prevent terrorist activities. So, you know, I just thought I'd throw that in, because you'll probably get all that soon. Enjoy. So, um, yeah, good cartoon, I like that. Um, so, the first time I gave this talk was at an ISSA meeting in the UK. First thing I should say about the ISSA in the UK is it's basically full of 50 year old guys in suits that are scared of computers. They're actually genuinely scared of their blackberries. They're like, <laughs> so, you know, this is an ISSA meeting, slightly different. But the um, first time I gave it, I was told that this talk was dangerous and that people get entirely the wrong idea. Now, hopefully you'll draw your own conclusions. I hope. Um, I was also told that in the UK, the media's calmed down a bit regarding cyber terrorism. Uh, let's have a look. Um, 14th September, um, there was an article about how stock exchanges, including the London Stock Exchange, were defending against a organised cyber attack by terrorists. On 1st of December, there was um, part of a funding programme announced or GCHQ to read my email more effectively. Uh, basically what's happened is the UK government have scraped the remains of our economy together to get £650 million to fund various intelligence gathering agency, uh, agencies, including GCHQ. On the 25th of August, there was an article about how a Chinese TV programme showed an apparent cyber attack on the US website. So that's just China fucking showing off now. <laughs> um, more interesting, the reason why I put it in is on the 9th of March this year, there was an article that was published about how the private sector is being asked to submit data voluntarily to GCHQ. I mean, GCHQ can request it. They're a bit like the NSA. And as much as they're a bit shady, they get lots of money, but nobody actually knows what they do. Uh, but basically, companies are now volunteering to give them traffic data. Wonderful. 
So it looks like it has really, really calmed down out there. So, I don't want to labour the point, but the media does report terrorism. That is why terrorists are terrorists. Because they've got this wacky theory that terrorists are terrorists because they're effectively a PR company. Right? And as much as a PR company stages a media event which gets coverage by the media, and you know, they get the message out there. That's what terrorists do. They're, they're basically rogue PR monkeys. Now, I would argue that a lot of the shit that's spoken about planes falling from the sky, Chinese hackers destroying the face of the earth in 15 minutes, is just that it's shit. And it doesn't allow for actually defined risk. I would also argue that we need to remove the fucking hyperbo hyperbolic nature of the debate and actually have a conversation that's based upon informed risk. Crazy idea. So, where does cyber terrorism come from? What, what, what is its ilk? <laughs> of its genus, even. So, 98 saw the first reported act of overt political cyber terror. Now, you could argue that you know, it was earlier with the East Germans buying you know, West German data and American data from Hagbard and the like, but actually that was just a bunch of West German hackers trying to feed that cocaine, cocaine addiction. But, you know, not that political. Um, basically what happened in 98 is the Internet Black Tigers, who have the most awesome name ever, um, transmitted about 800 emails a day for a fortnight time period to various Russian embassies around the globe. Now, what they planned to do was disrupt communications. The problem was, even in 98, a crappy version of Phoenix Mail or whatever could handle 800 emails. So, not really that effective. Um, they're very frequently cited as the first cyber terrorists, though. Now, the thing is, terrorists have to cause an effect. That's why they're terrorists. Um, the Internet Black Tigers, apart from having a fucking awesome name, <laughs> achieved nothing. It turns out that spammers are better terrorists than cyber terrorists. <laughs> Um, a bunch of pro-Serbian hackers called Black Hand, almost as good as the Internet Black Tigers, but not quite, try harder, uh, basically disrupted NATO's comms. Allegedly, they got some data out of a couple of UK servers that they shouldn't have got it out of, um, and there were lots and lots of viruses and bombs flying around. Personally, I'd be more worried about the bombs, but, you know, eh, I just didn't get, you know, as excited media coverage. Um... No, yeah, also in 98, we have Moonlight Maze, awesome name, uh, where according to the US, uh, lots of military computers got attacked by the Chinese, I'm um, sorry, the Russians in this case, and in um, Newsweek, the, re the, the then US Deputy Secretary of Defense stated that the US was in the middle of a cyber war. It's unclear who won, it's also unclear whether it ended or not. I hope you won. The US Department of Defense knew about it, so, I don't know, did you win? Nobody knows. <laughs> um, in 2005, we had news of Titan Rain. Like the Russians, the evil Russians, you remember Red Dawn? Awesome bell. Um, the Chinese decided to have a go at the US systems. Um, also, in 2005, you had the first use of the term APT. That's Advanced Persistent Threat, or Marketing Bullshit. Um, in 2009, you also had the Chinese coming back for Operation Aurora. And according to the likes of McAfee, stroke and stone, um, we're all doomed and we're all going to die and it's all the Chinese's fault. Damn you, you chow mein eating people. <laughs> it's weird though, how all of these attacks, every single one, happened around the time of RSA. So at a time where people get together for a big vendor clusterfuck, something always goes down, which means you have to buy more shit. <laughs> Weird. This is slightly tangential, tangential information, but interesting nonetheless. 2008, um, the US 304, 304th even, mobile infantry, got a bit bored doing army stuff, and they're like blowing shit up and decided to look at the threats posed by Twitter, because that's more important than driving a tank of unarmed civilians. Um, basically, what they wanted to do was see how terrorist groups, e.g. Al-Qaeda-like, so, kind of like Al-Qaeda, I don't know, they believe in Mohammed, um, use mobile telephones and could use social media. 
Uh, Thymines are all over the place, you can look them up. Um, but they're fairly speculative, shall we say. Um, they reported a number of pro-terrorist mobile phone interfaces. That's wallpaper and screensavers to you and me. And methods by which mobile phones could be used to track um, various stuff. You know, terrorists can use street map to find out where your secret bases are. Um, what they also wanted to do was see how Twitter could be employed by their adversaries. And a quote from the report, because it's awesome. Twitter has become a social activism tool for socialists, human rights groups, communists, vegetarians, anarchists, religious communities, atheists, who are obviously not part of the same group, um, political enthusiasts, activists, and others to communicate with each other and send messages. The question is, which one are you? Personally, I'm a vegetarian anarchist, but I don't like being put in the same, you know, lump as terrorists, weirdly. I don't believe that being interested in human rights makes you a terrorist. Odd. So, basically, their assertion is that social media can be used by terrorists. Um, yeah, it could. They could also use carrier pigeons or pens or talking. Um, Twitter's got a number of subpoena issues. Basically, they subpoenaed, they subpoenaed WikiLeaks data, and Twitter said, they're subpoenaing us, isn't it funny? And basically made the federal government look like ours is. Which, you know, they obviously can't manage it by themselves. Now, you've got to wonder how many other flu- subpoenas have flowed through since 9 11. Unheard of, untold. Now, my guess is terrorists are probably aware that an American organization will share data with an Amer- American government. Because, you know, they're in the same country and shit. And terrorists probably have figured this shit out. So, it seems highly unlikely to me. The terrorists are going to use Twitter for anything other than saying, let's have a good it'd be awesome. They'll actually use, you know, closed media forms. Now, you could use Twitter for open source intelligence gathering, but it's a pain in the arse. I really don't want to read about how a US Army sergeant has recently gone to the toilet. It's quite dull. Um, can it be used to plan and schedule attacks? Yeah, it could. Um, it's also highly likely you could put coded messages onto blog pages. Yeah, that's what I put on the internet. I keep doing that, by the way. This is my new hobby. I get bored quite easily. Now, is social media, which again is a really retarded fucking phrase, a threat? Yeah, if you post details of your troop movements on it, it's a threat. People don't do that, though. Um, is it being used by terrorists? No. Uh, did the US Freedom from Foreign Mobile Infantry want access to Twitter in 2008? Yes! <laughs> this shit's being used by terrorists. Can we, can we have access to it now? It's <laughs> so, alright, ne- next year I think they're planning to research Facebook and how that can be used by terrorists. <laughs> now, I don't want to dwell on state attacks, but I will cover off North Korea because this shit is genuinely hilarious. Now, according to reports, the first of which was written by a major Steve Sin, of the US Army. Yes, there is a major sin in the US Army, and he's writing and not aware of his ironic name at all. Um, there is a super elite gang of 17,000 North Korean hackers known as Unit 121. Um, bollocks, because his source for that is one anonymous guy, e.g., the little voice that lives in Major Stevenson's head. Now, Kevin Coleman, who I talked about when I first began, wrote an article called Inside Unit 121, in which he quoted Major C. <laughs> um, the problem is, um, as I say, it's based upon an anonymous source, so you can't verify, you can't check. I got him to Kevin and said, look, what's your source, bitch? He said, talk to MI5. Remember, this is an intel guy. He knows all about intelligence and the threats posed. Or not. MI5, for you, those of you who don't know, are the intelligence community that monitors domestic terrorists. What he meant was MI6, which is slightly different, but you know, what does he know? He's only an intelligence expert that's testified to Congress five times. <laughs> now, my point is if, DP, if the DPRK hasn't got super hackers, how come non state groups with less money have? Yeah, I'm sure um, Kim Jong-il's probably got a bit more money to spend 
than some sheep herder from Afghanistan that doesn't like the US. So, what I wanted to look at is what an individual attack could do, because I am an individual attacker. I have no band of terrorists. Damn it! If I did, I'd take over the world like the Chinese. Uh, what sort of information is out there? Uh, what could a well finance group do? Um, will I be discussing stuff that's potentially illegal? Yes. Have I done anything illegal? No. <laughs> what I did do, officer, and you can't prove otherwise, is I applied um, dot mill ideas and basically used open source intelligence gathering. Or reading the internet. So yes, you could go on Google and look this shit up yourself, but what would be the fun in that? But they do have a free bar, just saying. So, uh, what sort of information is out there? Um, that's a repeat slide. <laughs> and this is what happens when you write them when you drink. <laughs> right, so, some of this is just me ranting. In fact, most of this is just me ranting. Um, basically, to avoid having to write anything incriminating down. <clears throat> so, there you go. Be warned. Um, so, the UK, as you probably are aware, plays a major role in international finance. Basically, we're the financial bitches of the world. We will store your money and spend it on shit. We have no problem with that. Um, there's loads of crazy theories about terrorists turning off the ATM network and various other stuff floating around. But before we begin, um, I'd like to discuss a payment pro pro uh, processor. Basically, in the UK, if you accept online orders, you have to put those online orders and card data for a payment processor. We work for one that does about 30 million quid of business a year. Great, wonderful. They paid us fuck all, by the way, so damn them. Um, basically, um, Problem was, their last two information security heads had gone off with stress. One after about two weeks of starting the job. And I know why. Because basically, they had a network of about 8,000 systems, of which they knew about two. So 6,000 systems, which they didn't know what they were, where they were, how they worked. It was great. And this handles 30 million quid of business a year. Awesome. Get physio, draw a diagram, you'll be fine. So, anyway, ATM um, networks in the UK managed by banks and sort of a system called Link. Link network is really fucking hard. It's air gaps, it's, you know, it deals with money, so it's basically evil. Um, hence, it's probably easy to go after the ATM itself. Everyone here, I assume, is familiar with skimmers. I'm not talking about the shit that goes across the seas. Those skimmers, you can make your own. You can buy the faceplates off eBay for about $14. You can buy a mini card reader for about 200 bucks, and you can make your own skimmers. Or you can pay a dodgy Bulgarian 800 quid and hope you get one of those. So, yeah, just saying. Um, you can always go after the ATM firmware itself. Several people have. Um, Barney Jack has gone after it. Ralph Yasser in Italy has gone after it. And this unidentified gentleman went after one in Hong Kong. Damn them. Someone says really fucking hard to play in the street, by the way. Um, so, are firmware and physical attacks too, are too hard for you? Don't worry. All ATMs have management modes. Most of default credentials. Great. With time and enough patience, you can probably find them all out. Um, in the UK, we use Triton ATMs. They're frequently found in convenience stores, all over the place, garages, uh, pubs, strip clubs, and uh, various other locations. How do I know? I checked. I was doing research here. <laughs> um, manuals are fairly easy to find, as are the ATMs themselves. They pop up on eBay all the time. Um, or you could just read the Trishan, which has the master passwords for them, which are there. Um, why bother though? That shit's too hard. Well, you could bother because, you know, um, if they're in a convenience store, it's very unlikely the convenience store owner has changed the default credentials because, you know, he runs a fucking convenience store. He's not an IT tech. If he was an IT tech, he wouldn't be running a convenience store. So, in 2007, a couple, a couple of guys, Aldoa, Mughal, and Tazuli, who I shall henceforth refer to as the Three Stooges, um, convicted of the UK Terrorism Act. Their crime, apart from setting up the really retarded Al-Qaeda in Northern Europe, if you want to attract, you know, the unwanted attentions of, you know, 
intelligence communities, but it doesn't call itself Al Qaeda in Northern Europe. The thought. Um, but their crime was basically to engage in low level fraud to fund their jihadi activities. And this guy in the middle did not get a beating off the police. He actually looked like that. Honest, really, he did. He walked into a stair, I don't know. Um, for those of you who don't know their story, basically what they did is they used known public malware to, uh, to key lock Windows boxes. Uh, they then used the implied credit card details on gambling sites, Paradise Poker, funding terrorism, shut it down, um, to launder the source of the CCs. They then used the cash, and this is fucking awesome, to buy like GPSs and tents and manuals on how to blow shit up. From Amazon! <laughs> Terrorists are using Amazon, how awesome is that? Um, were they caught by the sophisticated surveillance of the UK intelligence gathering community? You would have thought so, they'd be using fucking Amazon to buy the big book of bombs and paint <laughs> and GPS. You would have thought somebody would have picked up on this shit. No, nobody caught up on this shit, why bother? Basically what happened is a, Swed a Swedish Bosnian terrorist, weirdest combo ever, got caught, and had one of their mobile numbers in his phone. Yay! <laughs> so, quick, quick digression onto carding. Basically, UK banks are bastards, and I have proof. Basically, if you're a merchant and you get ripped off, you then contact your acquiring bank, or your payment processor. Basically, some banks will confirm that the fraud happened. Some, and it's usually yours, will, um, Deny it or not comment because they'll cite the personal data protection of their customers. We can tell you about customers' potential transactions. Now, if a bank works as, uh, works as a payment provider and an acquirer, then they'll tell you, but not all, not all of them do. So, why do acquiring banks do this? Well, they're dicks, you know. But basically, if you don't admit fraud to the merchant, um, the cardholder then has to prove that that fraud happened which is actually quite hard to do, you know? Um, basically, what that means is the system of fraud reporting, particularly as pertaining to credit cards in the UK, is broken. Um, it's much easier to do than planning Trojans or skimming or going after a stock exchange. Really easy. Will I tell you that the acquiring banks are? No, look it up. So, another little digression. We worked for a major UK retailer, big retailer, they've got like 500 stores in the UK. They were like, can you break into us? We went, all right, can we have some money down? Thank you. And the way we did it is we walked into one of their stores, um, funnily enough, the one closest to my house, <laughs> um, went downstairs, more shop floor with legal fleet, oops, backs, shit. And um, there was a little door marked staff only. Ooh. <laughs> Through the door marked staff only, nice warehouse, I can help myself to goods. Also, a little office in the corner. Went into the little office in the corner. They had a comms cabinet. They had a lockable comms cabinet. They also had keys that were in the lock of the lockable cabinet. <laughs> so we opened the cabinet and basically stuck in our own uh, rogue AP, went to the car park and basically owned the shit out of them. This is a major retailer and this is not the first pen test they've had done. They've had proper physical red teaming done and they still don't know how to lock doors. So, yay! So, if you want to do something dramatic like hack a stock exchange, though, you've got to know about stock exchange protocols, like the Financial Information Exchange Protocol. If you want to do that, check out a talk called Hacking the Trading Floor, which is one of the few talks that were any good that was ever delivered at RSA. It's a really awesome talk. That said, most stock and trade orientated frauds are internal. Um, anybody here ever heard of carbon trading before 2010? Anyone? No, no fuck up. Oh, one guy! He works in finance, ladies and gentlemen. If you're worried about the economy, if you're sick of the banks taking the money, he's the guy! <laughs> but basically, no fucker had heard of it. But some guy, some guy ran, ran off with like $30 million, which made it reportable. This is why most frauds are internal. You know, there's loads of examples, like a guy called Sergei Almenkov, didn't sound all dodgy, Red Dawn, Red Dawn! Uh, basically, he was employed by Goldman Sachs and stole, stole their trading algorithm to sell it to another house. You know, you have to work in finance to rip off a stock exchange effectively. If you're too lazy to hack, and you're too poor and paranoid to purchase credit cards, there are other ways and means. 
as was mentioned in an earlier talk today, there's shitloads of car data out there. Um, I did a quick one-night survey of pasty and paste bin and the like, and found about 15,000 of them. Um, of course, out of that 15,000, some are going to be fake. Some are going to be flat, some, have been, some will have been reported, and some will be completely made up. I've invented a 16-digit number, how clever am I? Some, however, will work. For example, there. Now, the thing is, if you're a terrorist group, getting two of your intern terrorists to check the validity of credit cards, yeah, it's worth investing in. So, most carders, they keep things simple. Max Vision, you know, they find a reliable exploit, scan for that, uh, find a reliable form rather, scan for that form, exploit, get data, move on. Of course, PCI DSS is going to stop that because, you know, foreign companies and small companies and, you know, the pizza shop down on the corner will obviously, you know, obey the rulings and dictates of PCI DSS. Um, you know, obviously. So, if I was a terrorist, though, and I wanted to cause chaos, what I would do is I would find a very weak merchant, I would obtain the card data, and I would only use the card data that belonged to non helpful acquirers, e.g. the banks that don't tell you there's been a fraud, and then I'd profit and buy a unicorn. <laughs> so, Brian Friendly Skies, Aviation, there is more to life than money, allegedly. So, air traffic control systems are fun. Why are they fun? Because their job is keeping planes flying around, not their security of their systems. That's what they're concerned with. Um, there's a guy called Writer Kunkel, who has an awesome name, again. He sounds like he should be, you know, a catchphrase in a Bolivian comedy show. Oh, it's what's my Kunkel. But he did some really awesome research, which was done in the DEFCON 17. If you haven't checked it out, check it out. Um, but tell you, people actually discuss the terrorists, their major concern is planes falling from the sky. Can I make a plane from, fall from the sky? So, in the UK, air traffic control is controlled by a system or an organisation known as National Air Traffic Control Services, or NAS.co.uk. Basically, that was set up as a private public partnership in 2000, uh, this decade, coming out of that. And basically, it consists of four main operational centres. You've got the London area, the London terminal, Scottish area and Manchester, and various, about 15 air traffic controls scattered around UK airports. Basically, it breaks down like this. You've got 49% of it that's owned by the British government, 5% of it that's owned by staff, the British Aviation Authority own 4%, and the other 42% is owned by seven airlines. So basically, you've got about eight, nine organisations all trying to compete for the same organisation, that's not going to be a major cluster fuck at all, is it? So, LinkedIn, awesome, I love LinkedIn, much better than multi, yeah. Um, basically, with a couple of simple queries, I got the information security manager, the IS analysts, about 50 of them, the flight plan managers, their infrastructure architects, the senior software engineers, and the heads of safety, security, and program management. Uh, they're all named, obviously. Some of them have contact details. It was awesome. Call me on. Um, and basically, the format of Nats is first name, last name, Nats. Um, so, I had for basically a full org chart by the time I'm done. Um, so, if I wanted to stage a mark, uh, targeted spear phishing type attack against Nats, piece of piss, all I have to do is write the malware name. Or, you know, borrow it from somewhere. They also use uh, WordPress as their web publishing platform, which obviously is hyper secure by default, and you know, not all dodge. So, what tech stack do they actually run though? Well, in March, they published details about something called the Electronic Flight Data System. What that does, weirdly, is track flights. That's the Electronic Flight Data System. Um, it runs on Wacom tablets, and the reason why we got it in the UK is because it was first used in Nigeria. So it was cheap. Uh, we then bought it and then realised that Nigeria has less planes than us. So it didn't actually fucking work. <laughs> so, as of 2008, that signed up to the European Commission Single European Sky Initiative, which is a way for Europe to all, fly, uh, all track flying planes together. That uses its own tech stack. Um, the, the technical uh, specifications are out there. Read them, they're funny. Um, that said, 
If you had sufficient funding, or state support, or uh, an imaginary super, super elite North Korean hacksaw, <coughs> you could potentially focus on the hardware itself. Wacom tablets, made in China, sticking a back door. Happy days, the Chinese are coming. <laughs> and should you wish to listen to air traffic control talking amongst themselves, Jeff, where are you? Um, um, you can listen to it on air radio. Granted, that's an offence under the Wireless Telegraphy Act, but if you're a terrorist, you don't give a fuck. Um, I would have thought. Um, their frequencies um, are listed online, which is ever so helpful because you don't need to use your scan mode. And in the UK, we also have the Hathbrook system, which you guys invented, which is basically a way for air to, air to ground to communicate via multiple bandings at the same time. That's why it's a pain in the ass to monitor and very unlikely to be of interest to a domestic terrorist, I would have thought. Seeing is always better than hearing. The porn paradox, ladies and gentlemen. Um, there's a guy in the UK called Brian Dewhurst, and he found online um, webcams of airports. Now, pretty dull airports. Oxford Airport, for fuck's sake. Who knows that? Oh, yeah, people who live in Oxford. Um, but one would have thought, from a security perspective, having a webcam of your airport, e.g. the runway, not really that helpful, one would have thought. So, talking about Presswick, that's Presswick Air Traffic Control, which looks like the most dull place in the world to work at, unless you get that chair and just go up and down the aisles on it. <laughs> Why am I talking about Presswick? Well, a couple of reasons. Um, it controls more air space than any other European air traffic control. It's the biggest air traffic control in Europe. It controls about a million flights a year, and it controls all the transatlantic flights. So when I came here, I was trapped by Presswick. Yay, I feel safe and secure. It allegedly fell, it fell over in 2009 for a day, which caused complete fucking chaos. Um, fascinating. Yeah, it is. Because why is it fascinating? Well, eBay. We had to uplift our office. And basically, there's now five of us. So we needed a 48 port switch, obviously. So I bought one on eBay for 20 quid. Because you know, eBay's great. Problem had a little sticky label on the back. Um, and it was fully loaded with Presswick's Nats config. Um, it's, man it's ex Serco stock. Serco are the biggest organisation you've never heard of, by the way. Um, so, what was on there? Well, it's a Cisco box, so they're full config. So, they're shitty passwords. Yes, they had a Cisco account called Cisco. Yay! <laughs> Their main management account, this is hyper-fucking-secure, though you know the one that allows you to set up VTP trunks, had the super-complicated password and um, auth combination of backdoor, backdoor. That took us about, what, two and a half minutes to figure out? So basically, as well as their shitty passwords, we had their full VLAN details, 50 plus VLANs, all their upstream switch data, all the domains, um, all the service, all the details of the services they're running. Press quick on SAP if you're interested. Uh, and as I say, their full VTP trunk. We also had their uh, full read drive access to their SMP community strings, which, funnily enough, named after aircraft. Air traffic control named shit after aircraft. Why the fuck not? Nobody will ever figure that one out. That's hard. <laughs> this, interestingly, is the device in question, and I put this here for a reason. It's because it's got the amazing warning screen that states, this session has been logged by Serco PLC. That's how good Serco are. When shit's on my network, they can still log that shit. <laughs> now, I was going to bring it with me and have a play, just because I wouldn't have to talk. Um, but, as well as air traffic control, Serco also manage prisons. They also manage the welfare system in the UK, which is forcing people off the dole and into work, even if they don't want to go and are disabled. But they also uh, are in charge of the UK border agency and immigration, so I'm having a great time going home. Um, so I might have got the switch here, but getting it back, bit of a fucking problem. So, um, I reported this to Serco, obviously, they went, you what? Oh, shit. Um, that was... Uh, about two days ago, so then I think they've had time to remediate. Maybe. But, but I left some, obviously, because I'm a nice guy, left some feedback for the seller. <laughs> so, 
above and beyond my playing with the email feedback, which I dearly love, by the way, uh, another common nightmare scenario involves disruption to con and then cons, and we have to go like sh shit off a monkey sticker, if you'll excuse the expression, because I've got about another 400 slides to go. Loads of data and voice, net data and voice networks, so I want to focus on that. There's less focus on weird stuff like X25. What is X25? Well, X25 is an international package rich net data network. Before the internet, there was X25. That's what came first. Um, basically, X25 networks are owned and operated by national telecoms, by and large, and a number of other private operators. They're set connecting to X25, pain in the arse. You either need an X28, uh, X28 pad or an X25 gateway, and it's not easy, effectively. So why bother? Well, it's an old stack, thus you can't secure it. It doesn't play well with IDS, it doesn't play well with IPS, it doesn't play well with others, because it's old and cranky. And get off my lawn, you damn kids. Um, that, and you can also war dial it, because you know, they use network u uh, user um, credentials that are guessable, shall we say. And loads of fun stuff runs on X25. Um, for example, in the UK we've got a mobile telephone company called Vogue. I don't know if they've made it here yet. But all their SMSs are sent via X25. That's true for most other um, telcos. Um, so you've got a deprecated stack running effectively in environments which may or may not be secure. Kind of interesting. Yeah, especially in Greece. Um, in Greece, all their, all their national lottery runs over X25. I incidentally am moving to Greece. Uh, that said, it's a Greek national lottery, so it's about 40 euros if you win. But if you win every week, you have a fucking cunning plan. Handily, though, uh, there's an organisation called the International Telecom Union, and they publish, publish details of the, de de the, the data network ID codes used by X25. Basically, you've got the data network address plus the network user address, which is 15 digits at most. You can access those systems. How do you find those systems? War dialing. And why can you war dial them? Because all data network addresses are reserved. They never change. So what sort of stuff is still reserved in the UK? Well, we've got Vodafone, who I talked about earlier. You've got the Nomura computer systems, um, DNIC, which... No more, for those of you who don't know, handle the infrastructure for the London Stock Exchange. <laughs> um, you've also got Raycall Telecom. Raycall, by the way, became Talis. Talis basically made baby killing shit. So, you know, if you want to read about secret plans, go do it. Um, I've got to go move, move bloody quickly because I've only got five minutes. Basically, go play with X25. It's fucking awesome. So, um, what else can you do? You can use VoIP. VoIP's awesome, you can find open VoIP with Shona. Once you've got VoIP, you can find up your own premium rate numbers and funds you had that way. This is why I wanted to hurry, because this is fucking hilarious. Cross-site scripting, easy. Simplest web vulnerability to find anywhere. Easiest to address, but also can be indicative of all the shit going on on the surface. If I was a terrorist, it's what I'd start with. Has an organisation got cross-site scripting? Yeah, they've probably got shit code everywhere then. Woo! So, what did I find? Well. If you want to buy Hummer, they've got cross-site scripting. Um, if you want to buy some chemicals, you know, to poison your kids in an Indian village, Dow have got cross-site scripting. Uh, downtown Grand Rapids have got cross-site scripting. <laughs> Experienced Grand Rapids have got cross-site scripting. The right place for advancing the West Midland economy have got cross-site scripting. Ride the Rapid, which is not a porn film, I found out. <laughs> I've got cross-site scripting. WCSG, who's a Christian family-friendly rap show. Cross-site scripting. That'll learn Jesus bashers. WFGR. Side scripting. And a flame guitar. How awesome is this radio show? WWGRD, who gave me free tickets to come here. Cross-site scripting. Wood TV, cross site scripting. WOTV, cross site scripting. WWMT, cross site scripting. Hall Render, who sponsored this con, cross site scripting. And Dambala, who do um, malware research, cross site scripting. So, um, apparently, the threat of cyber war is looming. 
In the UK, we're spending 650 million quid on developing offensive weapons because buying Metasploit or using Metasploit is way too low fi uh, Basically, rogue states and political groups are coming to get us. We're all going to die. Why? Are attacks against computer systems increasing? Yes, they are, because people have more fucking computers. <laughs> are physical attacks, which are a bit more worrying because you can die, like properly die and get blown up and shit, are they increasing in non-Western countries? Well, yeah. Pakistan's had 48 successful attacks, e.g. shit blew up, against airports. The UK and the US combined have had 18. And this is in the 10 year period from 2000 to 2010. So, you know, don't fly to fucking Pakistan. Dangerous. Do the attacks that are made, or not made as the case may be, make excellent press? APT. Um, yeah, of course they do. That's why people talk about them. Um, what can you achieve if you create a sustainable atmosphere of fear, though? Well, in the UK, we can now detain without trial. We learned that shit from you, by the way. Uh, according to the terrorism act of 2005. We can also opt people out with their human rights, which is lovely. I'm not quite sure how we do that. But again, we learned that shit from you. And interestingly, we've also got the Police and Justice Act, uh, under which Section 37 makes, it guilt, makes a person guilty of an offence if he supplies or offers to supply any article believing that it's likely to be used to commit or to assist in the commission of an offence. So, don't write anything down, don't talk at conferences, and definitely don't publish any fucking talks, because they will put you in jail in both the UK and Germany now. Um, we've got an ever-increasing surveillance state in the UK. It's really getting quite sophisticated now. Um, we've also got fucking terrorists now, which is weird. Because you think with all the surveillance, they'd, they'd notice them shopping on Amazon. Um, in Russia, you can't buy a prepaid SIM. You can't do it no more. Uh, you're talking about in the US, because you know only drug dealers and terrorists use prepaid SIMs and not paranoid bastards like me. Um, if it happens to you guys, it'll come to us. In 2010, <laughs> this is genius, uh, a guy at US Strategic Command one, um, basically wrote, wrote a paper in which he proposed that users wanting to access the internet globally could be required to use a biometric scanner before continuing. They're actually talking like that now. Now, obviously these mechanisms may negate threat, but um, it'll obviously only ever be used for that, not for spying on you, obviously. That would be wrong. Now, I'm not scared of terrorists um, because, you know, there's always going to be idiots with bombs. Um, I am terrified of ill-informed and injured reactions to it. If you actually give a fuck about security, talk about things sensibly. Have an informed conversation about risk. Don't talk about political bullshit. Now, let's keep the arguments based in reality. And I'd like to close with a quote from Gandhi, who states that the enemy is fear. We think it's hate, but it's fear. But that said, Gandhi was shot by a terrorist. So my entire argument may be somewhat fucking negated. So. I've got no time for questions, um, but if you have them, I'll be outside smoking and trying to recall 